Xiao, why don't I start uh, with you and ask you a little bit about uh, your background and what you do at EY and how that relates to the discussion today. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Xiao Zhen, and uh, I'm actually uh, work for UI uh, US, and I'm a, a partner uh, in charge of uh, uh, China Overseas Investment uh, in US, in Americas, uh, within the 31 countries. And uh, I have been working on this uh, for last, uh, um, I think eight years, starting 2009, so almost nine years. So uh, I actually, I uh, uh, born, raised, educated back in China, Shanghai, and I went to Shanghai Jiao Tong, Jiao Tong University. My major was uh, power mechanical and engineering, and I got my master and a bachelor and a master degree uh, over there, and then I came to the US uh, I think uh, 20 something ye years ago. <laughs> and uh, then I switched my major to uh, uh, accounting. And the only reason I got there because the, one of the business school offered, my, uh, offered me the full scholarship was accounting major. <laughs> so yeah. I ended up uh, at a UI. So and I, uh, I started with a UI Boston uh, uh, in uh, 1997. So I have been uh, with the UI US for 21 years, 21 and a half years. So I made a partner in 2008, and I started in 2009, Chinese companies starting coming to the US. So I started pick up that wave, and uh, now here we are, and uh, uh, I'm so uh, fortunately, and uh, I really grow and I see help the Chinese company grow, and uh, we actually grow with the Chinese company here in the US. And uh, I think uh, we're really happy to work with everyone here uh, one more time uh, again and uh, given the very challenging uh, situation right, right now. So and, uh, we actually here is uh, really helping a, a Chinese company from beginning to finish uh, in terms of uh, uh, their business here in the U.S. And uh, uh, more relevant to here today, I think, is uh, giving the uh, Chinese-U.S. Uh, trade attention uh, right now, and also uh, giving the CFIS, and uh, most recently mm -hmm. passed the revised version, and uh, uh, which already effective on August 13. So we can uh, talk about more about that. What does that mean to the Chinese investment? All right, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you mentioned CFIS. I, it's funny that hasn't come up yet. So thank you for. Or maybe not for bringing for bringing them up, Dexter. Let's go over to you. Could you please uh, introduce yourself? Thank you. Uh, first, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, my name is Dexter Burley. I'm the president and CEO of Surge Energy America. We are a wholly owned subsidiary of Shandong Jingxiao, uh, which is a publicly traded uh, company in Shanghai, in China, on the Shanghai Exchange. Uh, I personally uh, have about 38 years of oil and gas experience in the U.S. and around the globe. Uh, I spent 28 years with ConocoPhillips and another five years with a small private equity backed uh, company uh, and then was fortunate enough to find my way uh, to meet some very interesting uh, Chinese colleagues that uh, were interested in setting up a business in in the U.S. And, and, and investors that were interested in investing in oil and gas properties in the U.S. Uh, so in 2015, I joined uh, that enterprise, uh, and I, I, I think I am the example of Greenfield Local. Uh, uh, we uh, generated a team from scratch. Uh, as Mr. Yao had mentioned, I was uh, a company of one when we started. <laughs> here in the U.S. and today, uh, actually when we, we started in 2015 with a purchase of a small oil and gas asset, uh, all our assets are in West Texas. Most of you have probably heard about the, if you know anything about the oil business, uh, you know the Permian Basin in West Texas is the place to be and, uh, and that is where our assets are. We started in 2015 with an enterprise value of about $165 million. Fast forward today, three and a half years, $4.3 billion estimated enterprise value. Our Chinese investors have invested uh, roughly about $1.5 billion of equity in these properties in, in West Texas. And we've since 
reinvested another $1.7 billion in drilling activity. We, uh, we produce about 75,000 barrels of gross oil in West Texas, and, uh, and I, I, I often, uh, in, in speaking engagements, uh, say Surge Energy is the smallest little com biggest little company you never heard of. Uh, and because of us being uh, Chinese owned, we don't have a lot of reason to be in the public eye like most uh, oil uh, companies here that are public. But at the same time, we enjoy the best of both worlds. We have an investment here, and we have our counterpart colleagues in China, and we, uh, we work hard to try to extract and optimize the best of both of those worlds. So I'm happy to be here and, uh, and talk some more about the uh, China-U.S. relations. Just a quick follow-up question, Dexter. How many people work for Surge? Yeah, good question. Uh, we have about 150 people now mm -hmm. and about 80 permanent contractors. So we're roughly in the 200 range. And most drilling in, in Texas and Permian. All, all in West Texas, mm -hmm. and it's all drilling. We, mm -hmm. we do everything from uh, get the land, drill it, get the oil out, get it to market. Great, thank you. Ramiro, over to you. You work for a, a pretty established big U.S. company. Can you talk a little bit about your role and what you do there and how that relates to what we're talking about today? Certainly. My name is uh, Ramiro Rodriguez. Uh, I work for Jacobs Engineering Group. Ni hao. <laughs> That's good. Um, pleasure to be here. We are a 77,000 people firm and growing. We focus in infrastructure. Uh, we are a solutions provider. So we look from consulting, from uh, the planning and permitting phases all the way forward through typical design development, procurement, construction, operations, maintenance, and if you want to close the facility remediation and repurposing facilities. From the standpoint of my personal experience, I'm an industrial engineer. Uh, I've been with this organization, its family of companies, of about 24 years. A Georgia Tech guy. A Georgia Tech grad, yeah. I grew up in the Caribbean, in Puerto Rico, and then I moved to, to the East Coast, and about seven years ago moved uh, to Houston. I've been working in the oil and gas sector since uh, 2007. So from my perspective, I think the Chinese investment here in in this market is, is a great opportunity for, for both countries. I think it just brings a lot of exciting opportunity, a lot of challenging projects for both nations to work together and a lot of, a lot of great areas of collaboration. Great, thank you. Sha, I want to go back to you and, and, and ask you a little bit more to drill down into your business a little bit more. Are you handling clients from China and looking at relationships in terms of all different kinds of businesses or is it just oil and gas? Is it national? How, how does it pan out like that? Yeah, so um, our part, you know, uh, maybe everyone knows and uh, EY is the uh, global uh, accounting and a consulting firm and uh, we, we have uh, two, 250,000 people, you know, global wise and uh, in America it's about 80,000 people mm -hmm. and it's really provided uh, services, uh, uh, arrange audit tax and uh, uh, transaction advisory and advisory uh, for all, industri all industry, all the sectors. And uh, so, given my uh, focus in terms of a Chinese investment in the US, so we really focus on two types. One is uh, a green investment, uh, just like uh, Chao Xiao and uh, uh, business, and uh, also uh, merge acquisition here. Uh, so, uh, we actually have uh, really think everybody here, uh, and, and a particular overseas investment here from China, uh, our business in terms of China inbound uh, business in the U.S. Uh, here and also in America, so we overall our revenue in terms of EY revenue, service income revenue, uh, we already uh, reached to 100 million uh, two years ago, and uh, last year we made a 100. Uh, uh, three million U.S. dollars, and uh, just for that, so you can see the magnitude of that, and it is a service income. So, uh, again, uh, answer your question is across all the sectors and all industries. Yeah, Great. thank you. Okay, Dexter, I want to uh, start. I want to ask everyone. I'll start with you and, and ask you about this trade war and the tariffs, and and ask you if you're starting to see any of the effects of that in your business. Yeah. Uh, in the oil and gas business, obviously, we use a lot of steel, and uh, 
with the pipe we run in the ground, and, and that is where uh, most of it could show up. Uh, to date, we've not seen an incredible impact in that arena, uh, but we do, we do see it on the horizon. Uh, overall, in our business, that is uh, a relatively small part of the entire spend. And so to date, and expected in the near term anyway, we don't, we don't see a lot of impact on that. Uh, I think from, from, from our perspective, uh, the concern is more uh, on the greater and broader impact on the relationship between the two countries and the, how that could bleed over into a, uh, a, a more uh, contentious business environment, which we, we, we uh, on a private level, uh, all that is, works very well. We've, we've managed to make those connections and those relationships and make the business work at a pretty high performance level. And so obviously from our perspective, uh, we'd like nothing to interfere with that. Uh, our, our job uh, is to re make returns for the investors and, and that's what we're interested in not having a lot of interference with. You said you guys produce, what, 70,000? 70, 75,000 75, barrels a day gross at the right. moment. Uh, you know, we, when we started in 2015, we had about 20 wells ar across 80,000 acres. Uh, we've drilled about 100 to 120 wells a year, so we're up to close to 300 now. Uh, does that oil go to China or? Uh, yeah, interesting question. How does that uh, work? It, it doesn't. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, it could if right. uh, if we wanted it to at right. this point, but uh, it is consumed locally. Okay, and then how do you how are you coordinated with your Chinese parent in terms of your operations? Yeah, uh, we have early on we established a very clear protocol of how the re the relationship would occur and how communications would occur, and to my Chinese colleagues' uh, credit. Uh, they were very cognizant of the fact of needing that local content and ensuring that we uh, were able to work inside both the regulatory environment locally as well as along custom lines, customary uh, practice lines. And so uh, they gave me large degrees of authority to be able to set the company up on their behalf. And as a consequence of that, that, that continued build of credibility and trust over the years is what ultimately, I think, makes it work at a high level. Mm, that sounds like a very valuable lesson, actually, right? Uh, absolutely. It, it, uh, you know, I, I, I find that uh, in, investing uh, is a little like music. Uh, it, crosses, it crosses international lines pretty well. Uh, what, the investors in, in China are not that different than the investors in the U.S. A good profit is a good profit. And we're all focused on uh, on how to make that the best. And uh, I think for our U.S.-based operations, uh, we are uh, we we want to provide good returns to our investors, uh, whether or not they're in China or in the U.S. is is not as relevant. Uh, so that's what we're focused on. Great, Ramira, over to you. I want to ask you about you know maybe the conversations to the extent that you can talk about them at Jacobs in terms of um, the relationship with China. Um, how it's perceived at your company and maybe how things are changing and how you're planning going forward. Yeah, China is an important part of what we do. We have offices in Suzhou, uh, Shanghai, Hong Kong. Uh, so we're not internally just focused toward what comes from China to the U.S., but also what, we, what China does in China. From the standpoint of where I operate, I work in the energy, chemicals, and mining resources sector. And mm -hmm. As part of that sector, we also have to factor the guys in my company that work in aerospace technology, environmental nuclear services, buildings, infrastructure, advanced facilities. So when I factor all that, their sentiment is China is a key player, a key partner for the long term. So when I look at all these Chinese companies in the U.S., we want to be able to hold their hand, so to speak, to be their partner in their needs as it relates to you know, the planning aspects of a chemical facility, how to deal with the regulatory agencies, that's a key part. A lot of times people need to understand is it is Chinese investment. We have to respect Chinese strategy. It's their money. We have to 
help them make good profit, as my colleague said, but we also have to help them navigate through the local localization issues that Mr. Yao was mentioning earlier. So they have to make sure that they have a business partner, whether it's the Greater Houston Partnership or other organizations, so that they quickly learn the basics of how to get their project approved early, develop early, and so forth. So to wrap it up, at Jacobs, we try to pay attention to all those factors, you know, the economics, we pay attention to what happens with all these things about the trade tariffs and all that. But in, in general, we, we see a positive outlook for the relationship and the years to come. Right. And so do you work directly with Chinese companies or do your, yes. your, some of your colleagues do then here in the United States? Both, yeah. I do work with uh, Chinese companies and some of my colleagues as well. Right. And, and, and as, in terms of the offices in China, so are, do they work with companies from the U.S. that come to China as well, or is it mostly domestic Chinese companies? Both. Yeah, we okay. have both. We, we have uh, U.S. Uh, companies going into China asking us to help. We have also have had Chinese companies coming to the U.S., Right. I think I said it backwards. You know, U.S. companies right. going to China, and Chinese companies coming to the U.S. We've interfaced with both right. in our experience. Xiao, over to you. Can you talk a little bit about? You talked about the environment being difficult, which of course it is a little difficult right now. It's interesting because everyone, I think, keeps saying the same kind of thing that in the long term everything's going to be okay and we're going to work through this. And I think probably everyone hopes that is mm -hmm. the case. But you, I guess you don't know, and it's, but it's, it's kind of an interesting, and it, very interesting time. And so um, what are some of the things that um, people are thinking of right now and, and the, the friction, child that you're seeing or um, the planning or people making or changing their strategies at all? Yeah, it, it is a very uh, challenging uh, environment right now. And uh, even though I think at a state level, uh, uh, I think a state government level is very, very supportive uh, in terms of a Chinese investment, but uh, however, on the federal level, still very, very challenging this moment. And uh, everybody just wait and see. And uh, that's the only thing a lot of company is doing that uh, right now. And uh, But uh, however, I think uh, uh, I think it was just yesterday, right? And uh, CGCC uh, New York and uh, uh, Ms., you know, Mr. Xu, our chairman, she uh, organized a, a, a breakfast meeting with uh, uh, our vice minister of uh, foreign affairs uh, of uh, People's Republic of China, Fu Ying. Uh, so that was really uh, timely and uh, very sincere, uh, you know, di dialogue, also very open dialogue, talking about uh, both the U.S. and the Chinese side of uh, concern about current situation. So I think Miss uh, um, uh, Fu is very optimistic in terms of uh, Chinese investment in the U.S. And it is, even though there's a lot of rumors and uh, talk about particular CFIS, in a, um, which is, uh, will impact uh, foreign investment into the U.S. in the infrastructure uh, area and also, uh, you know, particularly stay-owned company, uh, whether or not it's going to have a huge impact on that. So we already see a lot of that, but even though I think uh, from the, our uh, central uh, Chinese government, uh, you know, uh, uh, senior o o officials are very uh, optimistic of that, but in the fact, uh, does have a, a big impact. For example, I think uh, uh, you know the uh, Section 301 list, you know, uh, getting uh, expanded bigger and bigger, large and uh, very large right now. And uh, for example, and also because the Chinese company, uh, Chinese side, of also doing one one match, and uh, so that's impact a lot. For example, for example, the uh, uh, I I do want I don't want to name our client's name, but a, a very large pork uh, producer here in the U.S. and it was acquired by the Chinese company, and they actually have a, a current business to import U.S. pork uh, into the in, in, into China and. Uh, but because of this uh, trade uh, tension here, uh, they uh, have to pay the 25% tax uh, to actually China side because that's the retaliation action, right? So basically wipe out uh, uh, basically all the profit 
Okay, so the the really business decision for them is they have to stop that business right now, and and have to wait until see what's going on. So I think a part of uh, um, I think uh, if everyone maybe remember uh, uh, last November, uh, you know the President Trump visited uh, China. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, between China and the U.S., that time signed uh, 250 billion U.S. dollars uh, uh, MOU. Uh, so those investment is uh, all in the discussion and uh, in process right now. But uh, because of this tension, because of the CFIS decision, and everybody is really, uh, really anxious and uh, just don't know what to do and uh, ask uh, questions and uh, oh my God, what uh, I we have to do, right? Just. Uh, uh, Charlie was just mentioned unpolitical. I mean, so what's the? Uh, we were asking that a question uh, in yesterday morning breakfast with um, you know Miss Yu. What's the action plan? What are people supposed to do? <laughs> you know, so a lot of uh, 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 a lot of things in the air. People try to figure figure it out. But I, I think uh, uh, in terms of you are here, I'm mean, just uh, uh, we can help you. And I think uh, in terms of uh, uh, there's a, a still a lot of a transaction going on uh, between U.S. and China here, but uh, people are starting asking, okay, uh, should I report it to CFIS this now? Or, you know, is this already, uh, uh, CFIS already have a new revised uh, version now, and it should it be uh, really, uh, uh, will be effective right away? I mean, the law is effective on August 13th, uh, August 13th but uh, the regulation is not. There's a detailed regulation still not coming out until 18 months from now. So what do we need to do? So that's the piece that UI can help you and doing really preliminary analysis, tell you what do we think, and then you can really uh, take our view and you can make your own own judge, own actually, uh, your, your own judgment on that. And in terms of, uh, uh, I think that, uh, you know, tariff in, the, in terms of customer tax side and uh, that is also very important impact on uh, each of uh, your business very, very uh, significantly. So that's piece that there's a still uh, a good planning you can do, and this is exclusion. And uh, you really needed to know, and uh, how you really get on the in, 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 you know that exclusion list as soon as possible. And uh, so there's a professional here t uh, to help you. All right. So I think everybody should uh, uh, still be uh, optimistic to uh, to. Uh, I think uh, business still good, and I think uh, just everything still temporarily. And uh, that's not the EY view, but that's my temporary, that's my own personal view, all right? So thank you. Right, well it sounds like uh, a lot of uh, anxiety and um, difficulty in trying to predict the future, which I think is natural. And it's interesting, I mean, how things work with trade. Someone was telling me, uh, a knowledgeable person on trade was telling me that when it came to soybeans, for instance, that there's obviously difficulty exporting soybeans from the United States to China right now, and that China's looking to other countries to get soybeans, and one country is Brazil, and that they were noticing the flows of soybeans from Brazil to China couldn't possibly be met by local cultivation production of Brazilian soybeans. So that the, the thinking was that the soybeans were actually coming from, guess where, the United States to Brazil and then going to China <laughs> that way, right? So. Believe me, you know, when people want to trade things in this increasingly global economy, things will get traded and um, it gets, I think it gets more and more difficult for governments to put up barriers and I'm thinking the same thing about, say, washing machines and you really think the people in the United States are going to pay $200 more for a washing machine than they could get somewhere else in the world. I just, I don't find that sustainable, but that's just my particular opinion. Um, Ramira, over to you a little bit. I want to ask you about, um, you know, the, the ideas of raw materials and stocking up and planning. And you mentioned this to me on the phone. Is is that something that companies should be looking to do? Some companies have already done that uh, before the tariffs went into effect earlier this year. Depending on the timing of their projects, some of these companies already bought ahead of the of the imposition of the 25% tariff. So some companies already did that. But it's more complex because you have to look at timing of your project, the amount of materials, 
And also, it's not just on the supply side, it's also on the uh, demand side. So if the market predicts that consumption on some of these uh, major commodities are not going to be you know, heavily you know, taxed from the standpoint of consumption, then that kind of tempers the, the price down. And what it becomes is a game of planning. You know, when do you expect your long lead items to be done? Uh, when do you expect to go online? And then you have to run your, your financials to determine, do I hedge? Do I get into a contract early on? Because at least I can make my, my financials work with the price today. Even in this uncertain times, I can lock in a price. If I think I'm going to be buying things for amount of a, an extended period of time, and I don't want to have that issue in my mind. Or, as some people already did a few months ago, I think uh, I know my, my forecast for the next 24 months, I'm going to go ahead and buy it now and not deal with that. So, it's a, I hate to say it, it's a little bit of, it depends, mm -hmm. but it definitely impacts uh, infrastructure development, not just consumer goods in, in that sense. It's everything at, in, in that standpoint, because uh, the amount of material that's moved is significant when you're building a new facility. And I'm sure there are people here from like U1 Chemical and others that can give very precise examples of that. But that's, in a nutshell, one of my opinions. It depends on, on the timing of your project. But again, you know, there are great firms like EY and others that can, and ourselves that can look into that and help you. We, there are in the market currently a lot of databases that construction firms use on great industry standard information that can tell you what, what the forecast should be based on, on the knowns and unknowns at the time. Great. Um, before I go back to Dexter, I, I want to point out that we're going to have, uh, for this panel, we're going to have some Q&A uh, coming up very soon. So if you've got some great questions, or if you just want to sound off about President Trump. <laughs> I find that that's usually something people either like to do or don't like to do in my experience over the past year and a half. Um, questions for the panel, to be more precise. Uh, we'll be taking those very shortly. Uh, Dexter, I want to ask you about um, other Chinese companies doing the same thing that your parent company has done. Um, are there other Chinese companies that have relationships with drillers in Texas? Um, if so, why? Or if so, why not? Uh, to my knowledge, there's not Many. I, I know of one other uh, that is uh, a bit smaller than we are. Uh, I, I think the entry barriers are pretty, pretty large. Uh, the, uh, we were talking about CFIUS earlier. That is one hurdle. Uh, the, um, uh, the regulatory process in both U.S. and China can be lengthy. And uh, in, in, in the acquisition <coughs> state, uh, in the U.S., most uh, sellers are not interested sitting at the table and taking deal risk for an extended amount of time while the, the counterparty tries to get regulatory uh, hurdles cleared. So it, 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 is, a, it is not an easy uh, business to get into. Uh, generating a team uh, of oil and gas experts that can both uh, understand the subsurface because uh, uh, we're, we, we build a huge facility as well, but we build it over a large geographic footprint and half of our facility is beneath the surface. You can't even see it. Uh, and so the engineering and the technology utilized to uh, bring that all the way from a greenfield acquisition to the point where you actually have a barrel of oil to sell is a, is a pretty... Uh, uh, a, a lot of moving parts in there, uh, and to put that team together is is no small task. And so I think, I think for the oil business, uh, the uh, a greenfield localization, it, it's hard to put all that together. And so I think as a consequence, that makes us a fairly unique situation. So how did the parent company decide to do this? Do you know? And are they happy with what's resulted? Yeah, I think I think they're. Uh, well, how, how they decided to do it, I think they actually, uh, the, the original investors actually saw an opportunity. Re recall, I said we, this started in 2015. Oil prices were not the best, uh, and, and frankly, it, it deteriorated a little bit into 16 shortly after the, they had laid uh, 1.5 billion U.S. dollars on the table. So, so that you had to have quite a bit of stamina to go through that. 
but they had faith and they had, uh, they had belief in oil price in long term. And so they, they chose a wise time to get in. Uh, and, and I think they're extremely happy with their investment today uh, when you think um, how fast and how rapid it's grown and, uh, and, and we're in one of the premier basins in the, in the country. Uh, half of the rig count in the U.S. Uh, is in West Texas. And uh, so uh, of all the basins that produce oil and gas in the United States, the Permian in West Texas uh, can withstand the most fluctuation in oil price. So, so they, 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 they happened in, I, I, I was going to say luck, but maybe it's just pure intelligence, I don't know, but they, they got into a good place, good address, at a good time, and so uh, uh, they're pretty happy at, at this point in the game. It's interesting because, you know, buying a big oil company, I mean, one a Chinese company, one of the big Chinese companies tried to do that and was turned down quite some time ago, right? It yeah. Unical, right? Yeah, and uh, with a lot of the, the CFIUS uh, progression that's occurred, that has been a concern for us. Uh, in terms of further growth opportunities, but uh, uh, our council uh, tells us at this point that at least as it relates to oil and gas uh, acquisitions, that the CFIUS process really has not changed that much, that, uh, that the process we went through in 2015 to acquire these assets, uh, if, if we were to, to pr proceed with something similar today, it would be a similar process. And, and that, while it was... Uh, it had a number of steps to it, and it was somewhat uh, time-consuming. It, it, it wasn't overly uh, burdensome. Right. Xiao, over to you, and I wanted to ask you um, about best practices. Leaving aside the current environment, um, just um, through your years of experience at EY, what are some things that Chinese um, companies um, have done well or that has, have worked well in the United States to advance their businesses? Um, I think it's very important as a people, I think as a talent and the localization is, is the key and uh, very important, for example, you know, I think uh, Shandong Yuhuang, uh, they found the child CL, then the Yuhuang jiu qi lai la. Uh, it's a very important, <laughs> it is a talent and uh, someone is really knows uh, both uh, uh, countries, cultures and uh, uh, also understand the business on uh, both sides and able to link uh, both together and uh, really create a uh, significant uh, value for the, for the company. I think, uh, for example, the talent, I just want to you know, I think everybody, people know Chen Li Xing, right? I mean, it is uh, a situation change, but Li Xing did a great job for Zhong Xing, that's for ZTE, right? Even though there's some, some things that happened to that company, but ZTE, because of Li Xing, you know, they, they did a great job, unbelievable job, become a number four uh, uh, mo uh, mobile uh, phone, po phone actual provider in the US. Uh, so. Uh, because those, uh, both of them are really educated in, uh, back here in the U.S. and uh, also in, in China, spend uh, their life uh, in both countries. So I think uh, talent is number one. And I think uh, also uh, the really working with their partners and as another uh, in find the right partner is the very important factor. And uh, you need uh, really to able to leverage the best resources here in the United States and uh, to uh, uh, partner in terms of partner with the local uh, government, local uh, business industry, and uh, local media, and uh, all the community. And uh, it is very important. And also, you have to be really uh, be patient and uh, uh, become, uh, you need to know, okay, how I can I be really uh, become a, a US Corp citizen here and uh, become a really local player and uh, that kind of mentality is very important. You're not going to try to become okay overnight, you know everybody overnight, you know you and uh, you will be successful overnight. That's not going to happen and it uh, take a while and uh, you have to be uh, really settled in and uh, look around, figure out uh, and, uh, who's the player, who's the right player, who you can partner with, you can uh, help, you can do business with and also need to know, you need to find a right uh, advisors uh, for your service 
service providers. I'm not really trying to do advertising for anyone, but I see a lot of our uh, today's uh, KPMG is here and Grant Thornton here and a lot of UI alum here. So our uh, UI uh, local senior manager here, uh, Loli is here. Loli, you want to raise hand? Yeah, Loli is here and uh, here uh, is leading our, uh, our Chinese, uh, serving Chinese company here in Houston area. So, and uh, so I think that the, uh, it's very important that you need to have a very uh, uh, trust service of pro providers really uh, serve as a kind of a gatekeeper for you. And uh, there's a risk, tons of a risk, tapping to this, fee, uh, this country, but uh, a lot of people try to help you, but uh, you need uh, right people around you. So it's uh, very important on that. And of course, uh, uh, there are, uh, our Chinese banks is very, very important. They are uh, here and they're really helping you and we women Zhongguo de Chie Bao Jia Hu Hang. So I think uh, pro providers very important uh, platform and Xu uh, Hang, uh, so Bank of China here and there's other uh, five uh, largest Chinese banks locally and also you wanted to work with uh, uh, US local bank as well, right? And uh, so, uh, eventually become a U.S. player, you have to compete with your peers here in the U.S. So, of course, there are also uh, Chinese government, uh, you know, I, I think Zhou uh, Chan uh, uh, is right here, and uh, provide a lot of uh, uh, local support from the Chinese government point of view. And uh, so the community is small, but uh, you have to be very well connected financially and the talent side and uh, uh, government and uh, become a, uh, a local corp citizen here is important. Thank you. That's great. I mean, I, I like that you said you sort of described a whole network that you have to set up. And Ramir, I wanted to go to you in a second, but first I have to ask Dexter because it just occurred to me while she was talking about that. And she talked about the local talent and partnering with local people. So I, I guess the obvious question for you is okay, Chinese company comes and knocks at your door and asks you to come work there. Why did you say yes? <laughs> I get that question a lot. Um, In Texas, right? I, You're I, here. I, I like a good adventure. Uh, um, I, I spent uh, some of my career in uh, Russia for a while. I spent my career working around the globe in various capacities while at ConocoPhillips. And I came to, uh, to really enjoy and look forward to the experience of broadening <laughs> both cultural understanding and just a, uh, uh, the opportunity to make friends that, that, that had a life experience just so different than I had that, that I, I saw it as an opportunity, not just a business opportunity, but a personal opportunity. And, uh, and that, that's frankly what draw, drew me to the table uh, relative to a, a, a Chinese partner uh, the fact that they also had an opportunity to start a business with a blank sheet of paper and they were willing to entrust me with part of the pen to draw the picture on that paper uh, really uh, intrigued me a lot. And so I think uh, we worked very diligently in the early stages to build a trust on both sides. Uh, I, I think that is uh, an incredible uh, foundational element that, that is that is necessary and without it, it would be difficult to create the success that I think we've had. Uh, a, a respect and a, and a want to understand each other and, uh, and as important an ultimate trust that, uh, that we both are, are uh, pointing at the same goal. Now, can I just stop right now and I want to give Dexter a round of applause for having that open-minded thinking. I have to say that's pretty unusual. I mean, I mean, personally, I don't know if I'm open-minded enough to be like, there's not a lot of people, be they American or Chinese, who would just say, I'm just going to open my mind up and learn and experience things in new ways and make a living, by the way, also. Thank you. Right? Yeah. I mean, because yeah, that, that, that's, that's an that's important part of the proposition. <laughs> Let's not kid ourselves, right? You've got to pay the bills, too. Um, Okay, so before I turn uh, over to the audience for questions, I just want to ask you, Ramira, maybe a little bit about NAFTA, which you've been talking about here. Um, I'm not sure how much of an expert you are, and then I guess you know a little bit about it. And um, to what degree is that connected to what's going on with China and just the general trade picture? Well, 
China is a partner to Canada and Mexico as well to the United States. So just like you were doing the example of the United States sending soybeans to Brazil going back to China, everything's interconnected. And uh, my personal opinion, and I could be wrong, is I think it's hopefully all this is that we're experiencing uh, from, the reg from the standpoint of the, the trade war, it's more of a, a negotiation ploy just to get a more equitable arrangement as perceived by each of the parties, right? So as all of you have mentioned, including yourself, uh, hopefully this is just a, a transient, a temporary s status. Back to your question about NAFTA, I think, uh, you know, Canada has great ports in the west coast of, you know, British Columbia. A lot of companies, whether they're Chinese-owned or American-owned or European-owned, look into the western part of uh, Canada to send investments in products, uh, chemicals, refined products to, to China. The same thing with Mexico. Mexico has a vast coast uh, in the other side of, uh, you know, the Pacific side of Me Mexico. And they have great infrastructure they've been building over the last 10 years in terms of pipelines, tanks, uh, vessel ports to send things back to China. So. Uh, the relationship between the U.S. and these partners in terms of flow of uh, refined products and other goods will ultimately end in China. So I think the, this whole thing, it's interrelated, and I heard uh, some of our colleagues at the beginning in the first forum talking about that importance of NAFTA. So at least uh, it's a building block and it's not an exclusive part of the arrangement, in my opinion. It's also probably not going to be called NAFTA anymore, uh, right? Perhaps, so I don't know what's yeah. going to be called. Mexico Canada trade arrangement or something. We'll Perhaps, figure it out. Yeah. Great. Um, so I now want to open it up to questions from the floor and see uh, who's got some questions from the audience. I know you've got some out there. Okay. Maybe behind the podium. I've got one right here. Yes. That, that, that's a really good question uh, because y you point out in addition to the general business environment that is in constant motion and in the oil industry we're pretty used to up and downs uh, and and we had the, the added language barrier which which was uh, a, a, a challenge as well because uh, everything takes a little longer and uh, uh, the understanding of what happens with the markets here, uh, because it, you know that since shale development, uh, much of the oil produced in the U.S. is is obviously uh, localized and consumed locally, and therefore we're we we we're kind of uh, somewhat influenced by the global market, but we're we're more influenced by local conditions, which is hard to understand if you're sitting in China, and and you're exactly right, uh, prices start deteriorating. And there's a lot of nervousness, particularly you can imagine. I just wrote a billion and, and a half check. I'm I'm not I'm not too excited to see my product uh, price for what I just bought start going south. Uh, we uh, we we continued to uh, to have a lot of dialogue during that period of time. A lot of a lot of numbers exchanged, as you can imagine. The good thing about numbers, they translate pretty quickly as well. Uh, and when we when we could show that both the growth that we could we could create, the uh, sensitivities on price as we move through time. So, so near term prices is, is not a, uh, uh, is not as important as what price will be over the longer run. And because we were in a basin, a particular basin in the U.S. that had extremely ca good cash margins, we could show that even in those challenged environments, we could still turn a profit, and with a little bit of help from price, it's just going to keep getting better. 
Uh, and, and fortunately, uh, we had begun to build that trust by that point in time. And, and uh, I'd like to say I'm just really that good. But uh, I, there, there was really a, just a trust factor that, okay, we'll, we'll keep going because we're kind of, we're, we've kind of put a big bet on the table. We, we kind of don't have a lot of choice. I hope this, I hope this guy know, knows what he's talking about. And uh, fortunately, fast forward to today, we're, we're looking pretty good today. So uh, they, I guess maybe my, uh, my credibility went up a little bit as price went up. But. <laughs> Good correlation there, right? Yeah. It didn't hurt. <laughs> right. Any other questions from the audience? Oh, there was someone. Yeah. Yes. Yes, you. I guess the first question could go to you, one of you two, probably, right? Do you want to do you want to take it, Ramiro? Then, yeah. okay. So, so how do you differentiate yourself when you're trying to get business in China? I guess is right. I think that's. You mean in China or Chinese coming here? U.S. <clears throat> right. Both. Sides. Right. Well, I think I think uh, from from our personal experience, I helped to our organization get its construction management license in, in, in China back in the early 2000s. So I spent time in, in Beijing, Shanghai, <laughs> and relationships are key. I was not going solo. I was working with my Chinese uh, brethren, you know, the, my colleagues in, in our office, and they were guiding me through the process. I knew what I needed to do. I, just like I was saying earlier in my conversation, you have an idea, a strategy. One was doing the same thing here now in, in the U.S., you have some ideas, but then you need to have a sounding board. So you want to have relationships that can help you in that sounding board process. Oh, maybe there's more regulatory aspects in the <coughs> environmental permitting process or the health and safety aspects of my considerations. Have I factored that in my due diligence process? So you build that conceptual plan early on and then start figuring out who I need to add into my network. Mm -hmm. And that happens to me, in my opinion, whether you're coming into the U.S. or you're going to China. And as you said, if I'm going into China, you know, I speak a few words in Chinese, but I need somebody that's a fully you knows Chinese speaker the same way. If I'm coming here to the U.S., you want to have somebody like Dexter, you know, helping you. So I think that's part. That, that relationship doesn't change whether you're in China or here. It's a people business. So you have to have that and build from there. Yeah, I think I'm, I, I just add on that. I think the business plan is very important. You need to have... Uh, Particularly, I think is a long-term business plan. You just so don't want to be short-sighted. You know, I'm just gonna go there in a two years, three years. But normally, it is the two largest economy in the world, and you need to have the very long-term view on your business and make sure this is the right market for you. And a particular, you need to your particular industry very well in both sides, and how really able to connect the both and create a greater synergy and. A, win-win situation and another thing is a very important uh, localization is a very important you know and uh, I think there's a lot of uh, uh, example here already and uh, so whoever are uh, able to do the uh, really uh, you know the globalization the key foundation is a localization so if, if whoever can do the best on that end whoever gonna win all right, right. thank you right. Um, and what was your second question just very quickly just uh, what is the most challenging phase when when yeah okay um do you want to grab that one Ramirez, really quick cuz I want to just go I'll just be brief right. I think uh, the challenges could be in any aspect of that business right. planning process I think is 
That's how I would say it. I, Dexter can also comment, but from right. my personal experience, it's been a, not having done that front end work creates a lot of challenges in the back end. So back to the business plan, run it by you know consultants and other partners, people that have done it before, to give you at least you know the check the checklist of things you have to develop. That to me is the challenge. And the, from finally the regulatory process that's usually sometimes right. overlooked because you may have everything to go quickly. But a government which you cannot control, whether in China or the U.S., may have a process that takes 18 months to approve. So if you don't factor that into your business plan, your numbers are wrong. All right, we're almost out of time. I want to ask Dexter one last question uh, that has occurred to me, and that is, when you are recruiting people to work for you, do you say, okay, come with me and work for a Chinese company? Do you, do you have to, is there an extra thing you have to tell them? Do you have to explain to these Texas oil workers, right? These roughnecks, these people uh, who work in the oil they, fields? Like, <laughs> is there, or do you just say, hey, this is Surge Energy, come work for here? I just tell them, come work for Dexter, and it right. all works. After yeah. that. <laughs> He's the correlation uh, with the price guy. I, right? I wish it was that easy. Um, no, the, the, it is an interesting uh, strategy, and it's a strategy that I've taken uh, to effectively minimize, as we, as we get our larger footprint, uh, meaning uh, the company started with, a comp with, a, with, with me, and today we're 200 to 250 direct employment folks, but we employ, any given day there's probably a thousand contractors running around our field. We have thousands of landowners, royalty owners. We pay about $250 million a year in either taxes or royalties, so landowners. So, so the core of what makes us successful is both sides of this equation. The investor, the equity investor, Chinese into equity investor, the constituents, all the stakeholders in the US, they're all winning. Everyone's winning. So it's not a limited where you're gonna win and somebody's gonna lose. Uh, and, and what we've tried to do is to this local content is that when we're interfacing with the community out there that is, as you say, they're, they're oil, oil and gas guys, uh, they see an oil and gas company. They don't know. They don't, they don't, we, don't, we don't make a big deal out, out of it. We don't hide it. I'm pretty proud of it, frankly. But it doesn't, it doesn't add, doesn't detract, doesn't, it's, not, it's not all that important that we're owned by the Chinese. What's important are, is, are we a good company? Are we a good community partner? Are we providing benefits to the community and all of our constituents? And ultimately, is the investor getting a great return for what they did? If we can satisfy that, I know, at least in my circle, uh, a Martian could come with the equity, and we're happy to invest it for them. It's not, it's not, it do, it's not as important where the funding came from. We, we went out on the road early this year and, to, and went to the U.S. debt investors, senior notes. We took out a $700 million senior note. Uh, we've got a bank consortium that we have a $750 million credit facility with, 22 U.S. banks. They all know. They, they do all their due diligence. They know we're owned by the Chinese. They know what we're doing. They're happy to do business with us because it's a successful business. And that ultimately is what people want to participate in, regardless of what side of the pond we're from. So that, I think, is ultimately what makes it. We don't, we don't use it to gain anything. We don't use it to detract anything. The business is what's the core. Great. I think that is a great way to end this session. Um, some really wise words. Please join me in thanking this great panel, Dexter Burley, Xiao Zhang, and Ramiro Rodriguez. <coughs>